اللهم صل على محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأجسال وشفائها ونور الأبصار وجلائها وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك الرحمن الرحيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers. On our father Adam and our father Abraham on Moses on Jesus and on his mother the blessed virgin mary and on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam brother chairman respected organizers of this program my learned and dear friend professor dr chandra muzaffar and our distinguished audience i can i should for the benefit of those outside of malaysia who are impatiently waiting to view this program mention that we have with us i can see at the front row switzerland iraq yemen or north of iraq could is part of iraq yemen algeria Kazakhstan, New Zealand, Britain and others that I am missing. But more importantly, we have with us the president of the Chinese Muslim Association, Dr. Haji Mustafa Ma, uh, who I met many years ago, and also we are honored to have with us the first secretary from the Russian embassy Russian embassy uh, our brother Vitaly Makovsky and the second secretary our brother Atem Shamir I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly uh, brothers and sisters here at the Pusat Islam of the Islamic Center in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We are happy for the occasion to join with Dr. Chandra Muzaffar whose eloquent and very incisive and persuasive presentation uh, makes it so difficult for me to now address the subject of an uncertain world in fact it's more than an uncertain world it's a very mysterious world <laughs> and the role of Russia and China in changing the world order I consider it to be a mysterious world because the world order is constituted by a mysterious alliance of Zionist Jews and Zionist Christians who control power in today's unjust world order and they are hell-bent on preserving their rule over the world by hook or by crook and uh, will not allow Russia and China 
or any combination of other states to seek to succeed in dislodging them and to create a new world order that would have justice for the world. Our view, which is uh, from an Islamic eschatological perspective, and let me pause to explain what is eschatology. Every Malaysian Muslim knows about Ilmu Akhirul Zaman. Well, the big and complex word for Ilmu Akhirul Zaman is eschatology. <laughs> Ilmu Akhirul Zaman or the study of the end time, the study of the end of history. Our view from the perspective of Islamic eschatology or Ilmu Akhirul Zaman is that this present world order, Zionist dominated world order, is so hell bent on preserving its rule over the world and taking its messianic mission to full spectrum dominance as Dr. Muzaffar has just mentioned that they are prepared to provoke world war they are prepared to face the destruction of most of the known world today it doesn't matter to them what damage is done what they want is to continue to rule the world until the end of history this is our islamic eschatological perspective in fact we view the present moment as one quite similar to the summer of 1940 when the world stood on the brink of world war we are now at that breathless moment waiting for another world war I refer to it as the second world war because for me what they call the second world war was simply part two of world war one <laughs> the unfinished work of the first world war and this is the second but this world war from our perspective and reading the ahadith the prophecies of prophet muhammad allah's blessings be upon him this world war which will be fought not only by nato but by its surrogates in the Turkish government the Saudi ruling monarchy and its, its Wahhabi Salafi religious back, backers by the Zionist state of Qatar by Libya and by all others who pronounce their concern for Israel's security this world war that's coming will target not just the world of Islam in order for Israel to subdue its immediate geographical region the Arabs but more importantly that this coming world war will target 
Russia and China. It will be such a world war, said Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, that birds flying in the sky will fall down. Which appears to me to anticipate nuclear war with thousands of nuclear weapons perhaps being used in consequence of which electronic devices and electronic warfare and cruise missiles and fighter aircrafts can no longer use space. Syria appears to me to be the flashpoint as Sarajevo was used as the flashpoint in 1914 and Israel is pouring more and more fuel with her aerial strikes on Syria anticipating that eventually it will provoke a response either from Iran or from Russia or from both and that that response would allow Israel and her ally in Turkey to then act in such a way as would bring the world war to occur. Prophet Muhammad Allah's blessing be upon him, described that world war as the Malhama. And he spoke about Malahim, indicating that it won't be one war, but perhaps a series of wars which will culminate with the greatest war mankind will ever experience. In order for us to understand the reality of the world today and to appreciate the viewpoint that we are now breathlessly located at that moment in time which is similar to the summer of 1914 and that we are about to witness world war it is necessary for us to seek to understand those who control power in the world today. They are a people who are located in European civilization, but not all of Europe. It is crucial for us to understand that they are located in Western Europe and from Western Europe to the United States and to Australia etc. And so Russia is Eastern Europe and China is not European at all. Those who control power in the world today must be understood not only in terms of geography but also in terms of religion. Western Europe follows a breakaway faction of the Christian religion. When Constantine became Christian, he moved his capital from the pagan city of Rome, the pagan city, to Constantinople. He built from the, what was originally there, the new city of Constantinople. And so this became the heart of the Christian world, Constantinople. And uh, it was from this heart of the Christian world, located in Eastern Christianity that a breakaway faction emerged and went back to Rome and created 
the Vatican and Western Christianity and those who control the world today are a mysterious alliance of Western Christianity and European Judaism. We say mysterious because Christians accuse the Jews of the ultimate crime of killing God himself. You can't do worse than that. And so an alliance between Christian and Jews is something truly mysterious and yet before our bewildered eyes it has been forged first through a reconciliation in which the Vatican played a mysterious role and then full-fledged alliance the Judeo-Christian Western Christian alliance Russia is not Roman Catholic. Russia follows the original Christian faith, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Chiang Kai-shek was Christian, but China was never Christian. And so Russia and China, and I'm saying this mostly for the Salafi who need to be educated about some things. Russia and China are not a part, neither geographically nor religiously, a part of the world order which today imposes his unjust rule over the world. The fact that Eastern Christianity has survived poses for Western Christianity an uncomfortable problem. Theirs is not the sole Christian voice that there is another Christian voice with a claim to Jerusalem, for example. And so, Western Christianity and European Jews and Judaism are very, very, very uncomfortable about the existence of an Eastern Orthodox Christian church in Europe, I'm sorry, in Russia and in Eastern Europe. This mysterious alliance of Jews and Christians in Western Europe acted in a way that was very unchristian and unJewish. For example, it was this alliance of Jews and Christians who created modern Western civilization which then embarked upon building a new paradise in the Western Hemisphere. And they needed labor to build a new paradise. And so they created a market for slaves. And once the market was there, then the headhunters emerged roaming to Africa and seizing free men and free women and forcibly then offering them for sale to a market which was there and ready and willing to buy them and take the Africans to the Western Hemisphere as slaves. This was not Christianity. This was not Judaism. What a strange new religion. Russia was never a part of the slave trade. I hope the Salafis are learning a few lessons now. Nor was China ever a part 
of that most brutal form of slavery it was ever the misfortune of mankind to experience. It is remarkable as my former Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Eric Williams, uh, wrote in his PhD thesis entitled Capitalism and Slavery that the Christian Church owned the slaves. And the Christian Church, I'm not talking about Orthodox Christianity in Russia. I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church and Western Christianity. Not only did the Christian Church own slaves and participate in the slave trade, but actively opposed William Wilberforce in his attempt to abolish slavery. And when a resolution was defeated in the British Parliament, Dr. Williams pointed out that the church bells rang in joy that the resolution was defeated in the British Parliament. Western European civilization acted in other unjust ways and Russia and China was never a part of it. In mysteriously using a newfound power which came to them from the scientific and technological revolution. A newfound military power to embark upon what appears to have been a messianic mission to wage a wars of aggression against non-European people to conquer and to colonize the rest of the world, to then suck their wealth as Holland sucked Indonesia for three and a half centuries, to grow wealthy and to live comfortable, to travel first class while the natives of the world were enslaved and they never decolonized until they had put in place institutions which would ensure that they would continue to rule over and continue to exploit their former colonies by proxy. Never decolonized until they had put in place institutions to ensure that the native peoples of the world who were less human than they were they were the ruling people of the world Western Europe would become copycats would live the way they live would dress the way they dress would eat the food that they eat McDonald's hamburgers and Kentucky fried chicken and forget about roti chanai and, and uh, chicken tikka who are these people who want to transform the rest of the world into carbon copies of themselves is this happening by accident or is there an explanation Yes, there is in Islamic eschatology. Russia never participated in these colonial wars. No. China never participated in these colonial wars to build empires that would straddle the world. We had Pax Britannica. But Russia never attempted or aspired to become a ruling power in the world, nor did China. We say it is to educate the Salafi Muslims who today need to be educated. The Western European 
civilization, not the Eastern. In, in forging a strategy to suck the wealth of mankind became the money lenders of the world, riba. And not only did they give to the world this usurious banking system, which is now poised to take over from governments in ruling the world through electronic money, but they also took gold and silver coins out of the market and gave us what one commentator has mischievously described as toilet paper money. The paper currencies that we now have, which have functioned as an instrument of economic and financial exploitation, impoverishment and enslavement of mankind, never came from Russia, never came from China. It came from the Jewish Christian Alliance in Western Europe, which today rules the world. Who are these people who want to rule the world as moneylenders, as bloodsuckers? They consider themselves to be the chosen people of the Lord God Most High. And they have a mission referred to in international relations as jingoism to civilize, to civilize the rest of the world, the natives of the world. A brown-skinned native man cannot marry a white woman, as Sukarno learned to his distress when he was just a young man. No. They are people who believe that they have a divine right to rule over the rest of mankind who are less human than they are. They have a divine right to exploit them for they are the chosen people of the Lord God Most High. In their eyes, we are just like cockroaches. Russia never thought like that. Russia never held the rest of mankind with such contempt. Every people have their ethnocentrism. But they never, the Chinese never considered the rest of mankind to be less human. Although Russia is Christian, it never followed the ways of Western Europe. Why not? Western European Christianity, we said, reconciled with European Judaism to build the Judeo-Christian world order. The USSR was covertly a part of the Judeo-Christian axis, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR. It disappeared just yesterday, so you surely have not forgotten it. The USSR was covertly a part of the Judeo-Christian axis. Christian Russia never reconciled with Judaism to become a part of the Judeo-Christian alliance. It was Christian Russia which was attacked in the Bolshevik Revolution. And there's more to come later on in this program on that. The Quran has spoken to us about that Jewish Christian alliance of which Russia is not a part. 
Let us for the first time now turn to the Quran to seek to understand today's world order. In Surah Al-Ma'idah or the fifth chapter of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a command. He says, Ba'da'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tattakhidhu al-yahuda wa al-nasara awliya ba'duhum awliya uba' wa man yatawallahum minkum fa innahu minhum inna allaha la yahdi al-qawma zalimin I have to quote the Arabic because Allah did not speak in English. O oh, you who have faith in the one God, the God of Abraham, do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. This is perhaps the first time some of you are hearing this verse of the Quran explained this way. If you look at all the translations, what you find is do not take the Jews <laughs> and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. They are friends and allies of each other, which is false. Which is false. There are many Jews in the world who are not allies of Christians, who are not part of the Zionist alliance, opposing Israel. There are many Christians in the world, lots of them in Russia, who are not friends and allies of the Judeo-Christian alliance. So this is a false statement. The Quran is anticipating the emergence of a Jewish Christian alliance. And so the Quran is not referring to all Jews. That is schoolboy scholarship. And the Quran is not referring to all Christians. That is schoolboy scholarship. The Quran is saying, do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies, who themselves are friends and allies of each other, referring clearly to the emergence of today's world order, the Judeo-Christian alliance. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ If you differ, with my tafsir, bring yours. Let's hear it. And whosoever turns to them with friendship and alliance, as those who so gleefully sought NATO's support to overthrow the Libyan regime, those fools with a capital F, and those fools with a capital F who call themselves the Free Syrian Army, taking weapons and taking greenback American dollars from the Zionist state of Saudi Arabia, from the Zionist state of Qatar, and from Turkey who is so happy to be an ally of Israel and a member of NATO, and taking weapons from Libya, to now overthrow the Syrian regime and Imran Hussein is not the supporter of any government in the world of Islam today so don't come with your nonsense that this statement of mine makes me a supporter of Tom Dick or Harry when you do that Allah says when you take support from them and you become their allies whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance you now belong to them you left Islam you no longer Muslim why do they want to rule the world these people 
about whom the Quran has prohibited us from maintaining friendly ties. Russia and China are making efforts to seek to dismantle this unjust world order. But the efforts which they are making, unfortunately, cannot succeed, even though they ought to succeed, because that empire is collapsing, as Dr. Muzaffar so brilliantly explained. The US dollar is dead, it's being kept alive artificially. And so BRICS has every reason to succeed. And there's every reason why we should be successful in making an effort to bring a new world order into being which will replace this unjust world order. But it cannot succeed from our Islamic eschatological perspective. Why? Why do they want to rule the world? Why are they hell-bent on preserving their rule by the hook or by the crook, even if it is to risk nuclear war with Russia and China? About 12 years ago, by our last grace, I was able to write Jerusalem in the Quran. And in that book, which introduced Islamic eschatology really, I analyze and explain and interpret it, hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, to the effect that history was going to witness three successive efforts at ruling the world on the part of this alliance. The first was Pax Britannica, when an obscure island off the coast of Europe that Napoleon contemptuously dismissed as a nation of shopkeepers. <laughs> when that obscure island of the coast of Europe was able to its naval power to establish 114 naval ports straddling the whole world on the eve of the First World War. Pax Britannica is a misnomer because there was no peace in it. It's not Pax, it was war, barbaric war, by, excuse the term, white man, meaning white European, who felt that he had a messianic mission to civilize Dr. Chandra Musafar and Imran Hussein. Pax Britannica, or Britain as a ruling state, did not mean that Britain had to rule every square inch of the earth. No. A ruling state is one whose power, political and economic power and dominion over the world was such that it could not be challenged by any rival or combination of rivals in the world. That made you a ruling state. And then came the second ruling state, part of our Islamic eschatology, when the United States of America replaced Britain and demolished Britain, demolished Britain as a ruling state. That's what Bretton Woods was about. Bretton Woods meant Britain couldn't rule the world anymore. The United States of America then gave to the world Pax Americana. And it is this Pax Americana which is now collapsing. What comes after that? According to the Hadith and my interpretation of the Hadith in my book Jerusalem in the Quran, it is Pax Judaica. All along from the very beginning they were telling a lie when they said that all that we want to do and the USSR was happy to sing that song as well all that we wanted to do 
All that we wanted to do was to give to the Jews a home where they could live, a home. And that's why they created Israel. But that was a lie. They never created Israel to provide a home for the Jews. They created Israel so that one day Israel could rule the world. And when Israel ruled the world, then said Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, a man would emerge. The Prophet described him. He said he would be a Jew. He said that he would be a young man. He said that he would be powerfully built and he'd have curls. And I always thought it was curly hair. Until an Egyptian said to me, no Imran, you're wrong. It's not curly hair, it's the curls that the Orthodox Jews have at the sides of their faces. He would have those curls, said the Prophet. And he would rule the world from Jerusalem and declare that I am the Messiah. And this brings us to eschatology. Christian eschatology says that the Messiah was Jesus, the son of Mary. And that he came and that he will come back. Islamic eschatology says that the Messiah was Jesus, the son of Mary. And that he came and that he would come back. But Jewish eschatology says that the Messiah never came. The Messiah is still to come. He could not have been the Messiah because he's a bastard. And the bastard cannot be the Messiah. And so they're waiting for the Messiah to come. And that's why Israel wants to rule the world. So that the world, so that history will end with a validation to their claim to truth. And Prophet Muhammad said that Allah sent someone who will impersonate the Messiah. And he will be Dajjal, the false Messiah. And this is why they want to continue to rule the world, even if they have to provoke world war, which will be nuclear war as never before explained in history. Will Russia bend her knee? No. Russia is already resisting. That's what BRICS is all about. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, and we have to recognize that yes, there was some merit in Marxist theory, economic theory. We don't deny that. But it is not the economic theory that was so dangerous. It was the role of the Soviet Union in suppressing and subduing and attempting to destroy Eastern Christianity in Russia and in Eastern Europe. And that's why they had the altar. That's why they stopped when they stopped, so they can give Stalin that role to do on their behalf. And the Soviet Union had another role to play, and that is to facilitate the migration of millions of Jews from Russia and from Eastern Europe to Israel. They may be Jews, but don't forget, they are also Russians. <laughs> they are also Russians. Russia will not bend her knee. The Soviet Union collapsed and Russia is now once more room. I cannot end without explaining the term room. There is a surah or a chapter of the Quran entitled Surah to Room, Room as R O O M Room. And in that chapter Allah speaks and He says, Ghulibatil Room, Room has been defeated. But after their defeat, within a short period of time, they're going to be victorious. And the Quran spoke positively about Room. 
who is room I hope the Salafi are listening to me room in the Quran was Byzantium which had its capital in Constantinople Eastern Orthodox Christianity which today is in Greece in Armenia in Bulgaria in Hungary in Romania in Russia when the Ottomans mysteriously conquered Constantinople the Ottoman Sultan Muhammad Fatih declared I am now room <laughs> you have to laugh at that I am now room I'm now the Emperor of Rome. <laughs> no. When Constantinople was captured by the Ottomans, the capital of Rome went to Moscow. This is what the Salafis can't swallow. Moscow is today Rome. And so Russia is today Rome of the Quran. The Ottomans did the best that they could possibly do to plunge dagger after dagger into the heart of Rome on behalf of Western Europe. The Ottoman Empire resembles Saudi Arabia like a mirror. Yes, there was the application of the Sharia and so on and so on and so on, as in Saudi Arabia. But why did you wage endless wars of aggression, naked aggression, against Eastern Europe, Rome, not Western Europe? They never took on Britain, they never took on France, but Eastern Europe and Russia. War after war against Russia. Why? Why did you have to enslave Christian women and make them your slaves in your harem? Ottoman sultans never married. They had their slaves, white Christian women. Why did you have to enslave Christian boys and convert them to Islam? What kind of theology do you have to support that? It came from Disneyland? And then train these Christian boys who are now Muslims to become the elite fighting force of the Ottoman Empire, the Janissaries. Hmm. But worse than that, in order to ensure this eternal ha hatred and enmity between the world of Islam and Russia and Eastern Europe, what Sultan Muhammad Fatih did shamelessly and disgracefully, and I am careful in my choice of words was to take the greatest cathedral of the Christian world, Hagia Sophia, or Hagia Sophia, and convert it into a masjid to the eternal shame of the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And so the Ottoman effort was to drive a wedge, which they hoped would be eternal, to ensure that there can never be an alliance between the world of Islam and Russia and Eastern Europe. The Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, said that in the end time you will make an alliance. He used the word sulh, not hudna. Hudna is a truce. But the hadith is the word sulh, a peace treaty. You will make a sulh with Rome. And so history will not end until the world of Islam, which is not in the embrace of the Zionists, that part of the world of Islam enters into an alliance with Russia and with Eastern Europe. And there's one more thing before we end. He said that you will conquer Constantinople. لَتَفْتَحَنَّ الْقُنْسْتَنْتِنِيَا وَلَنِعْمَ الْأَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا وَلَنِعْمَ الْجَيْشُ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشُ And he praised the commander of the army. And he praised the army. It could not have been 
that one in 1457, which disgracefully converted Hagia Sophia into a masjid. No. I have argued in my lecture the conquest of Constantinople in the end time, which I delivered at the International Islamic University last year. The, the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, is still to come. It is still to come. It will come after the great war takes place. A Muslim army will conquer Constantinople and that will be the end of NATO. If Turkey attacks Syria, it is going to provoke civil war in Turkey. And I think the whole world of the Kurds, and we have a Kurdish Muslim right here, the whole world of the Kurds will now enter into that war to support the Turkish Muslims who are seeking to liberate Turkey from NATO. And all the true Mujahideen from all of North Africa, I hope you're listening to me, will then be going to join that army. But the question arises before I end. Why would a Muslim army march to conquer Constantinople? Why? If I am alive when that happens, and we conquer Constantinople, the first thing I would do is to return Hagia Sophia to the Christians. This is your church. This is your church. You can remove the minarets. It's yours. The second thing I would do is to apologize to the Christian world for what was done for 500 years. And then Mustafa Kamal added salt to the wound by taking the greatest church of Christendom and converting it into a museum. <laughs> And the third thing that I will do is to restore the name of the city, Constantinople. Because that was the name that the blessed prophet used when he said, La al Constantinia. But before I end, why would a Muslim army march to Constantinople? Why not Jerusalem? I have only one answer for that. Only one. There is only one, there is only one military benefit that can be derived from the conquest of Constantinople in the Akhir zaman of the end time. And that is that a Muslim conquest of Constantinople at the time when Muslims and Russia are in alliance will free the Bosphorus for the Russian Navy to then pass through the Bosphorus into the Mediterranean and that's goodbye Israel thank you Oh,